going back now to this whole concept of, again, intermittent, continuous, trying to get lower levels. So, Ash, from a delivery system, comment, if you will, your thoughts about using an agonist versus an antagonist. Comment, if you will, about are, are there clinical implications based upon the delivery systems of microsurges that may be associated with some certain LHRH agonists? Yeah, so, you know, more recently to market, it's come into Garalix, which essentially is an LHRH antagonist as opposed to a, a previous agonist. And there, the difference is, is a couple fold. One, like, like you suggested, when you, give an, when you give an agonist, you can have a, sur a surge of the testosterone, and then each time you go to redose, there can be a surge. And people have shown this sort of increase. Um, it's mild, but, the, the, but certain increase around the time of redosing in the testosterone. The second difference is that um, the, you'll get some higher levels of FSH as, as well as there's, a feedback, as there's a feedback cycle with the agonist as opposed to the antagonist. So Degarelix, the data, shows two things. One, when the, the testosterone is suppressed and it stays lower, in my opinion, and, it, and it, stays, it stays there with none of these little blips. Now, I don't think there's ever been any uh, data showing the clinical significance of those microsurges that I can parse out. The FSH stays lower and goes lower. There's FSH receptor on, on microvasculature for, the, for, the, for tumors, and there's some thought that possibly it could lead to more angiogenesis among the tumors, so maybe that would be good. It's unclear. Degarelix does appear to delay the time to PSA progression, maybe a little bit better than the LHRH um, agonists. So that's one thing that's there. And then when used in the intermittent context, at least my take on the data as a urologist, again, is that the testosterone recovery when it comes off seems to be a little bit faster than with the LHRH agonists. And whether that's true or just the way that the patient populations were in those data sets, I'm not sure. But maybe to throw it to the, to the audience, I wonder if Degarelix is a better drug for intermittent energy deprivation therapy or, or not, or if they see a difference. Now, Dan, Dan, you did a study, though, looking at, looking at Eligard, which is, a, which is a sort of this atrogel delivery system. Talk about that, because you, you checked testosterone after a one-month injection looking at Eligard with their atrogel system versus traditional lupulide acetate. What were your find? I mean, didn't you find that you had longer levels of T suppression with yeah. this different with the with the atrogel delivery system? Yeah, there was a, it was a small study, 32 patients, uh, 16 in each arm, and it was basically comparing uh, lupulide uh, versus the atrogel system, the IM versus the sub Q. And what we found was that the area under the curve, the duration that these patients were exposed to testosterone levels below castrate in one arm was 28 days and the other arm was 45 days. So again, in, in, the, in the era of worrying about when payers are going to reimburse you for treatment options, uh, it was nice to know there was a comforting level to know that this patient was still going to have a suppressed testosterone and you weren't going to have a microsurge. Uh, we use a lot of Degarelix also in our clinic. Uh, my issue with Degarelix is not that it's not a great drug and I like the antagonist, don't have to worry about the flare, but I have patients traveling 300 miles and to come monthly for an office visit sometimes can be very restricting. And so it's nice to have two, both an antagonist and an agonist in your armamentarium that you can use when you need to depending on travel, cost, all those kind of issues. One oh, sorry. Oh. Just a small point on the Degarelix that for my patients I've used it in, it does seem to cause more of a site reaction also that's definitely there and for some patients can be somewhat bothersome. Yeah, but, well, yeah I actually disclose I have never used Degarelix. Um, and, and I actually, you know, the reason why uh, I think that it may be a mute, point, a mute point to the extent of where we are because there is not really level one evidence to suggest that one antagonist is better than, than an agonist. I tell my patients that the goal of the game for them is castration. I don't really matter how we get you castrated, you know, but we need to get your testosterone to be suppressed. Uh, it's a harsh statement for patients and significant others, but it's an important statement for them to understand that it's not the injection what is actually leading to the benefit, it's actually the effect of the injection that actually is what we're actually, uh, trying to accomplish. The importance of that is, you know, and I remind you, you probably remember that, the Garelix was actually developed for one reason and one reason only at the time. 
you know, bicalutamide back in the days was very expensive, right? And for those men with metastatic disease who were maybe having symptoms, either obstructive symptoms or bone pain or what have you, then you didn't want to you didn't want to actually give them a flare within the first 20, 21 days, 30 days. So you needed to block them first with bacalutamide and then put them on an LHRH agonist. So Degarelix replaced to some extent that. Well, bacalutamide is really I don't know the cost to be honest with you, but I don't predict it's that expensive as it used to be. And for rising PSA syndrome only patients, there is not a flare concern in my opinion because they don't have any symptoms. They don't. They're not going to get into troubles. For those patients who walk in the office with systemic disease, with symptomatic disease, then you do want to actually block them combined, and that's what I do. Um, but I also remember, that, I also remind you that the flare happens within day 20 to 30, so you can start both agents, an LHRH agonist and a bicalutamide or an AR blocker the same day, and when the patients flare, you will be blocked, and in theory, you shouldn't have a flare, right? So that is the reason why I'm not sure that Degarelix really actually is that relevant. I think at the end of the day, what we're talking about is we want to maintain your testosterone suppressed. And the question is, is it 20? Is it less than 12? Is it 50? And most of us would argue that no LHRH agonist or antagonist can render someone's testosterone undetectable. The new oral agents may be able to do that, but not the LHRH agonist that we have. I, I want to add one thing, and I agree. So I use very, very little Degarelix. Uh, I guess we're in similar practice situations. Um, and, and bicalutamide is very, very easy to get. And I do start them on the same day and, and have, have always done that. I would say that I am curious about the F FSH flare because in the context of side effects, there is a question of whether that may be involved in cardiovascular risk. And I'm not sure how that may happen, but I think it's something for us to study as well as cognitive function. So I wonder if we may find down the line that our side effect profiles may be different. Uh, and I don't believe that they are so strongly that I'm using a different medication and, and for me, uh, a lot of that thought process is also based around timing and having people from 300 miles away coming every month is challenging. But I, I am curious about that and, and eager to see where things stand in five years. Hopefully we can figure some of this out. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you, Alicia. I think that especially because we're, we're diagnosing prostate cancer in men that are much younger, we're, we're, we're seeing more high-risk disease. We know that those patients will ultimately fail definitive therapy. You know, LH, LHRH analogs are tough drugs. They're tough drugs. And, you know, patients from, from the cognitive dysfunction, from the cardiovascular effects, from the bone mineral density changes that we see, you know, we're, we, we set these patients up for some really potentially bad side effects. And I think as we move into this whole new post-macro world and APM and MIPS as we will start to be uh, be, be sort of reimbursed, uh, paid by how we utilize resources, quality of life issues, which is going to be becoming more and more impactful. I think we all need to be very cognizant of these, of these uh, potential side effects. So. Well, that, that brings up, a, you know, an interesting point. And again, when I trained in urology, we were doing a lot of bilateral orchiectomies, and that's how you achieve castrate. And, and again, you didn't have to worry about flares, and uh, you knew your testosterone was continuously suppressed and microsurges. And I think there was some new data from some of the from SEER data that's soon presented that shows that actually there's less of a risk of fractures, less cardiovascular morbidity. And I think the Cognitive effects, um, I think uh, some of the DVT associated were similar, but again, in this uh, world of macro and MIPS and APMs, I have a feeling we might be migrating that way, at least in the metastatic patient, maybe not in the biochemical recurrent patient. One of, one of the interesting things about side effects, and for that matter, cardiovascular specifically, is that if you look at actually one of the first papers that actually brought this to our attention was actually the uh, uh, MGH paper looking at you know, the Medicare paper, uh, fee per program in Massachusetts and what happened to men who under, undergo castration and medically or surgically, three months of lack of testosterone induces my risk of developing cardiovascular disease by sevenfold. That's huge, right? That's huge. That's the metabolic syndrome part. And that, to some extent, that data right 10 years ago is what pushed most of us to rethink the timing of utilization of, of, of these agents. Uh, but it is related to castration, and, and that's the part that is hard for me to uh, understand how you can overcome that. And perhaps your point, Alicia, which is the FSH part, you know, maybe that's why we may be seeing a little bit more cardiovascular disease for those patients who get medically castrated and not who get surgically castrated. But I, I think that when you balance the benefit, and, and to me, I'm more 
uh, early treated, I have to admit, especially with the new data from Stampede, from uh, the ECOG data of five in, in the United States and with you took 15. I, I think that uh, when you balance the benefit and the, and the side effect and the ratio between outcome improvement and quality of life improvement, I mean, just look at the ECOG uh, quality of life data, right? At three months, someone who gets hormones and chemo, a drastic detriment in quality of life, but the, at the end of the year, people who get hormones and chemotherapy, however you look at that data, have a better quality of life. You know, so, so you can improve these things, and the, I think the biggest issue is balancing that benefit and, 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 and side effects uh, ratio with, with patients and, 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 and how you're gonna support them. And as we, so I'm, I'm on the group that put that paper out, and or I was hoping, we're working on the paper. Uh, but uh, I think that we, we were surprised by that, we're encouraged by that. Better disease control may lead to better quality of life. And, and at the end of the day, if we can control people's cancer, I think they can feel better. And so it is, it's always a trade-off, and, and thank you for bringing that up.